this paper is called Designing Fractal Curves with Five-Fold Rotational Symmetry Using the Complex Number Golden Ratio. Now, you may be asking, what the hell is a complex number golden ratio? Um, and what I would say is it is the golden ratio as derived in the complex plane by adding two algebraic integers. And I'll show you that in a moment. <clears throat> the design you just saw was, was cut out with a laser cutter on wood. Oh, here it is right here. And um, I gave my fractal curve to my friend, Barry, who just got a new laser cutter. And um, we're, making new, we're making other ones. And this is funny, it's kind of like a two piece jigsaw puzzle um, where the puzzle is not figuring out where the pieces go, but how to get the damn thing fitting in. It's really hard, but once it goes, whoop, once it falls in, it's a, a very lovely experience. Um, okay, that's the physical thing. Everything else is in bits. So here's the golden ratio. And as you all know, um, the pentagon uh, with the pentagram inscribed within uh, demonstrates the golden ratio uh, in many parts. And in a way, the golden ratio is kind of self-similar because it, it refers to parts within parts and that, that can cascade on, on all levels, which is why I believe it's so friendly with fractal geometry, the golden ratio. <clears throat> So when I was working on my book, The Fractal, The Family Tree of Fractal Curves, Vince Matsko um, was helping me out with the book and he, he was editing the book. Um, and he said, Jeffrey, are you sure that plane filling curves are, can only fit within square and triangular lattices? And I said, well, of course, that's, those are the only two lattices that, that this can work in. Um, if you take the dragon curve, the Gosper curve, Hilbert, anything, it'll fit in within one of those two lattices. And so Vince kept asking me, are you sure? So I had to think about it. And um, so look no further than Penrose tilings. Tilings are very closely related to space filling fractal curves. Um, it, tessellating tilings particularly and Penrose tilings are space filling and aperiodic. And this was a hint, <laughs> uh, but the real, the real answer came from Stefan when we were at the conference in Linz, as he mentioned, um, we were sitting down uh, drawing pictures on napkins as we do. And um, we kind of came up with this question, how do we fill a Pentagon with a space filling curve? And of course, Stefan just showed you that and he, he provided a lot of the terminology that, that hopefully will help uh, you understand what I'm talking about because I don't quite have all the same terminology. But anyway, so cyclotomic fields was, was what I learned from Stefan. And um, <clears throat> here's my illustration of cyclotomic fields. Um, so the first cyclotomic field consists of one unit, the number one. You can add or multiply any number of these units to create any positive integer. The second cyclotomic field um, includes negative one. So any math, including addition and multiplication of these two units results in any integer positive or negative. Skipping over number three to four, we have four units, one negative one, I and negative I. And any combination of these multiplied and added will create points in the square grid or the Gaussian integers. Skipping over five, but keeping note of the coloring scheme that I used here. Um, we go to six and these six units in the sixth cyclotomic field determine the Eisenstein integers, which fill a triangular lattice. The Gaussian integers and the Eisenstein integers form Euclidean domains. So they have prime numbers and other uh, number theoretical properties. And those are the basis of the square and triangular lattices that I developed all of these fractal curves in. So the question is, is there something there in between? Is there some kind of in betweenness that we can explore? So here's what I learned from Stefan um, that the 10th cyclotomic field, which divides the complex plane into 10 equal pizza slices has uh, these units, these 10 units and, and we'll call it Zeta. So here in the middle of the diagram is Zeta. It's, it has unit length. And it, and it lies on the unit circle. If you add zeta with its conjugate, that is its reflection about the real axis, 
you get the number down at the, at the lower right, which is the golden ratio. So in a sense, two uh, algebraic integers create an irrational number. Um, and by raising zeta to a power, to an integer power, you can rotate about the unit circle um, to, to get to any of these uh, units. Um, additionally, the golden ratio has this interesting property that any two consecutive powers of the golden ratio has a ratio, has the same ratio. Um, and so this is part of its self-similar self -similar property and so we can raise uh, the golden ratio to, a, to an integer power as well as raising zeta to an integer power to create um, lengths and angles for these fractal curves. So each transform of the fractal or each segment, if you will, is determined by these two integers. The first, the first unit of the 10th cyclotomic field can be added to its conjugate, which is the same as zeta nine in the, in the uh, tenth cyclotomic field. So here's an equation showing m and n, which are the two integers that I can play with to determine these uh, segments or transforms in the, in the fractal curve. And one discovery that I made um, here was that, okay, so here's cyclotomic field eight, 10, and 12. Um, and we just saw 10 here and there's zeta with the golden ratio there. Um, cyclotomic field eight and 12 have their own irrational numbers if you apply the same, the same uh, 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 function here. And that is the square root of two, the golden ratio and the square root of three. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Um, I guess this pops out of trigonometry, um, but it's interesting because it kind of shows a certain relationship that I was not aware of before. Uh, Stefan showed me a paper by this guy, Peter Steinbach, and he describes these as a family of golden proportions um, using the diagonals of regular polygons as a, as a basis. So it's very interesting. And the heptagon is a very special case and Stefan has gone in that direction and it's uh, crazy complicated for me, but it's fascinating. Maybe I'll explore the heptagon one of these days. Um, so to make a space filling fractal curve with five fold rotational symmetry, I came up with six generators um, and they're shown here at the left and each generator has a tile associated with it. Um, illustration B here shows that I took the purple triangle and the blue triangle and created a closed triangle, a, uh, a golden triangle. And I'll show you the results of that in a bit. Illustration C here shows the two first integers here are those M and N in uh, variables that I described that determine the rotation and the length. And the last two integers in for each of these segments is the transform, which would be a 180 flip or a reflection about the segment. And those are the two transforms that I, that I use in my, in, in described in the book for all fractal curves. And so on, on the right here is uh, are the first four iterates of that red, um, number one generator, showing you how the substitution of these segments creates this space filling curve. And those transforms are important because it helps the curve stay out of its own way as it's, as it's iterating. Um, and here's a result of showing only the tiles, a close up, uh, not showing the boundary, um, showing the tiles of this, uh, of this fractal curve. And I think it's really cool. It's, it shows a lot of asymmetry and a little bit of symmetry. And uh, by choosing the right color palette, you can make these things push and pull visually to make some very intriguing um, designs. Here is the fractal curve uh, with a smoothing filter applied. And Stefan was just talking about um, self-avoiding and all that kind of thing. Basically, if you take all the vertices and consider them to be in a one-dimensional array, and passing a smoothing filter on it essentially makes the curve curvy. And the more times you pass that smoothing filter, the more curvy and out of its own way it gets. So here it is a pentagon with a space filling curve in it. Um, of course, the problem, the trouble with five as Craig calls it has a long history. Um, and I would say that the, the trouble with trying to tile the plane with pentagons 
may have resulted in many moments of frustration throughout history, but that frustration sometimes results in some beautiful solutions um, dating back to the medieval Islamic uh, mosaic artists, uh, Durer and Kepler, and of course in our lifetimes, uh, Penrose tilings. Wonderful stuff, uh, a periodic is very sexy, I think, and it's really fun area to be playing with. So here's the Peltz curve, as I call it, and Stefan showed a version of that. <clears throat> um, I don't, Stefan, I don't know if you mentioned um, in, your, in your talk um, that your curve has pentagons inside of it, uh, contiguous. No, you did, you did show the pentagons. It has- Yeah, but I didn't mention it, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and this is one of the cool things about Stefan's curve, um, that it has an infinite number of pentagons and they're overlapping or they're inside of each other and they all have a ratio of the golden ratio, of course. Um, this is my rendering of the, the Peltz curve, which has two generators, very elegant. Um, uh, I think that's the fewest generators you can have for one of these curves, I believe, Stefan. And maybe Stefan has a, the answer for why you can't do it with one generator. Um, so that's that. And now here's, a, here's another variation with a different set of generators. Uh, I don't remember what the generators were for making this curve, but I added a very subtle um, coloring of this to emphasize the pentagons. Um, and these all kind of have a branching pattern. I think that's just a natural, natural thing that happens. Um, and the branching patterns are, are very beautiful, I think. Um, and sometimes uh, you can almost see circular patterns here. Um, they may not be circles, but my eye wants to see them as circular. Here's another one. Uh, this one is in the art show uh, in Bridges. Um, and I believe this is a gasket curve, meaning that not counting the, color, the coloration that I used, if this were iterated to infinity, you would see an infinite number of triangular holes in this curve. Um, and of course, these holes have a golden ratio scaling factor. So this, this is in the art show. And um, here's another variation. Uh, notice that all of these form a triangular or fit within a triangle, which is the cap of the pentagon. Um, and, and I use a technique of, of gradation in the background and the foreground. And sometimes I like to make it so that the foreground and background are ambiguous with each other to, to create a little more intrigue when you're looking at these things. Here's a curve I discovered um, where sort of the left foot and the right foot of this funky little creature here has the beginning and the ending of a line that meanders through. And it includes the tiles. So it, so it creates this sort of pen, pentagram-like shape. Um, and I discovered from reading Craig's book, um, Durer had explored tiling uh, by putting five pentagons around a single central pentagon and repeating that process um, and um, leaves these little holes, like little planaria holes uh, that continue on at all levels and it creates this gasket shape. I found that I could make the same gasket shape with the fractal curve, and I call it the Durer pentagon curve. And um, these are the two generators that I used for colored green and blue to delineate the two different generators. And here are the first four iterates of, of that curve. Here's a variation of that. Um, uh, at, the, at the very left, it looks like the Koch curve, but it's actually got the pentagonal angles instead of the triangular angles, um, sort of like a squash coat curve. And it's strewn throughout here, the whole thing. And these little planaria pop out. I shaded them so that they look almost like foreground instead of background to make it more interesting to look at. Um, and of course, many variations. I've made hundreds of these. Some of them are very organic. Some of them are more geometric, but I do like to always keep the curve showing. Uh, because that's where the mathematical beauty is. Um, here's another variation uh, where you, you, you can, your eye can travel through the line and see the fractal curves. Um, and so here is a golden triangle filled with a curve and these have variable length. So the shapes are bigger or smaller and the sizes of those shapes increase as you, as you go in. 
but I believe it's space filling, maybe in the Cantorian sense, if anybody has any comments or thoughts about that um, as it goes to infinity. Um, here's one where the lengths are so small that you can't see them. All you see is sort of the leftover gasket from it. Um, and the holes in this gasket are pentagons and um, triangles. Um, and I highlighted a bit of a pentagram over here to the right to, to emphasize that, that part of the shape. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, one of the techniques that I've been using recently is to use photographs, blurred photographs, and using those instead of a gradient created in GIMP software. And by using a photograph and blurring it so that you can't quite tell what it is, it adds another level of read. I think it adds a, a certain um, aspect of reality that may not be recognized consciously, but I think it adds a, a depth to these images. Um, he, and here's one that has a landscape that I blurred a lot in the background, intentionally uh, creating ambiguity between foreground and background, because after all, these fractal curves fit within each other. Um, they, uh, if they're the same species, they mate in a space filling way. Um, and so that's the last image. Uh, this is a website that I include all of my designs. So go there and visit sometime. Uh, and that's my talk.